referral, no waiting room, no copay. Direct from the NYU Langone Medical Center, this is Dr. Radio. You're listening to Everyday Health with Dr. Carol Bernstein on Dr. Radio, Sirius XM 81. Welcome back to our listeners to your favorite show here on Dr. Radio at Sirius XM 81. I'm Dr. Carol Bernstein, an associate professor of psychiatry and vice chair for education in the Department of Psychiatry here at NYU. And a reminder for those of you on Twitter that you can follow us on Twitter at NYU Docs to find out the topics on each show as we're discussing it. And remember, call-in show. We are here. This show, this whole channel is for our listeners out there to bring you in contact with the very best in health in a variety of areas. Our phone lines are open at one eight seven seven. NYU Docs, that's one 3627 You can also email us at docs at SiriusXM.com. So in our last segment, we were talking about quitting. Well, this is a slightly different form of quitting. We're going to be talking about overcoming binge eating disorder. My guest on the phone is Jenny Kramer, MSW, LCSW. She is founder and executive director of Metro Behavioral Health Associates Eating Disorders Treatment Center. Whoa, Jenny, that's a big mouthful. It's located in Scarsdale here outside of New York City and in New York, I'm sorry. It offers comprehensive outpatient treatment for all forms of eating disorders, Jenny has been the director of the Renfrew Center for Eating Disorders in both New York and New Jersey for five years and has been treating all forms of eating disorders for more than a dozen years. She is co-author of the new book, and you're going to have to tell me how you got to this, Overcoming Binge Eating Disorder for Dummies. And I see with the book, Jenny, that, uh, first of all, welcome to the show, but it's part of that same logo of the Dummies book. So I'm curious as to why you decided to write this with this, you know, group because it's, you know, computers for dummies and yes. you know, it's all the for dummies. So, Well, I'll um, tell you how this, th- thanks so much for having me, Carol. Uh, I'll welcome. tell you how this came about. Um, you know, we were actually working with a, 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 a book agent to write a different book. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Wiley, who is the publisher of all the dummies books, yeah. said, gee, you know, we're really looking for something on this subject. And it was just kind of in what I hope is the right place at the right time. But truly, my co-author and I, uh, Marjorie Nolan, who's a wonderful dietitian, we had been looking to write a book on the subject anyway. And the dummies format is very useful because it really enables you to not have to read the thing from cover to cover, but to really find what you're looking for. And I, I hope it has our voice, but that it just, you know, is a useful reference guide for lots of practical tips. So, I, you know, I forgive my ignorance here, speaking of dummies. Uh, I assume <laughs> that, the, that the format, the general formatting of how you do it, when you said you can just, I mean, I'm looking at it here, you know, it's understanding the symptoms, becoming motivated for change, deciding to seek treatment, that, that this format is characteristic of all of the dummies' books. In, in, yes, they have sort of a skeleton format that yeah. they like, but certainly <clears throat> they allow you to do with it whatever you want. Um, you know, we, we had to develop, obviously, the full content, but right. there's a template that they prefer that you use just because it's worked. You know, right. so if, it, right. if it ain't broke, don't fix it, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, it also it has cachet, and, you know, you see these yellow and black books everywhere, and you think, oh, maybe I'll, I'll pick that up. So um, first, well, I always like to do this. Um, how did you get involved in eating disorders specifically? And let's talk a little bit about binge eating as opposed to anorexia and the others. But, sure, sure. You know. Well, I, I don't come to the world of eating disorders and addictions easily. I, I myself haven't suffered, but I was surrounded with it. Wow. Uh, many, many family members. Members and uh, also, you know, parents um, who suffered not only from binge eating but a parent with alcoholism. So I've, I've been around addictions a lot. I always knew that I wanted to be a psychotherapist, and um, this just sort of was a specialty that almost again fell into my lap at the right time. Um, you know, I, I was working with Renfrew and uh, I came to run for eating disorders, which is a well-known um, yep. uh, place, um, because they wanted not only my clinical but my administrative skills because I had had a prior career in medical management. And so there I was, and I was immediately 
fascinated and also humbled by um, how hard it is for anyone with any form of eating disorder, be it anorexia, bulimia, or binge eating. And, you know, we, we treat all forms, but certainly binge eating is a very compelling form because I don't think it gets very good press. I mean, I think people think that people with any sort of overeating, binge eating, emotional eating are just lazy. I mean, if only. Right. If only it right. was just that. So what is binge eating disorder? I mean, again, as distinguished from bulimia and anorexia. Well, you know, I think, you know, as speaking to one of the ex experts who put together the DSM, I'm a little nervous, but I'll tell you. It's all right. It's all right. I know all about the D. I mean, I'm not, about, but yes, the I'm well, familiar I'll, with DSM, yes. Well, I'll, I'll tell you how we look at it. Um, I, I like to, for, for patients, we like to distinguish three things. There's either what we call emotional eating, compulsive overeating, or binge eating. So if you are feeling nervous about something, if something's coming up, you're anticipating something, and you just feel uncomfortable, and you notice I'm eating that thing in relation to that, gee, why am I doing that? Well, I don't know why, but I'm doing it anyway. That's sort of an emotional eating event. It can be a singular event. Some people do it more often than not. Compulsive overeating in our minds is really something that's sort of an all-day grazing. There's no relationship to hunger cues, no relationship to satiety. Um, it's almost a dissociative event. You're just sort of kind of eating all day, and when you do eat a meal, there's no uh, relation to portion size. You're just sort of eating in a mechanical way, and the only cue you get to stop is that you actually feel, you know, almost sick. Binge eating has these components, but it's much more severe in that it is such a volume of food and such a volume of calories in a discrete period of time. Um, it can happen multiple times a day or week or month, but when it does, it really overtakes the body and the mind because it is just so many more calories than a human being is meant to take in in a period of time. And the other thing about it that is so compelling is that it more often than not takes place in very secretive ways. And so there's much shame and much guilt associated with it. I see. So you're talking really about the psychological component of binge eating, which is different than the just the overeating and the grazing. I think so. I mean, again, these things sort of overlap, but I think the binge eater knows that they're doing this in their bedrooms, they're doing it in the car, they're doing it on the way to being with people but never with people. Um, it's happening in the middle of the night, late at night. And the secrecy uh, is a big component of it. Very big, yeah, very right. big. And, 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 it, and it grows it because the behavior that you're trying to hide, you then do more because it's so painful to have to hide that behavior. So it, it just couples, you know, doubles on itself. Right. Okay. So let's talk. Can you just sort of give us quickly the the major symptoms of the binge eating? Because certainly the secrecy, the hiding, you know. Yeah. And then there's also just, you know, eating to what we call this point of being uncomfortably full. It, it really only begins to describe it. There's a physical discomfort from eating. I mean, imagine if you're eating, say, a day's worth of calories in one sitting. That's the best way that I can describe what a binge is, and it can be more than that. So there's physical symptoms. Um, there's also what we call dissociative, dissociativeness. Um, at a certain point, your, your brain is sort of flooded with the chemicals and the sugar of eating that much food, and you're almost unaware of what's happening. If you talk to most bingers, how they stop is they either fall asleep or they're in just such physical pain. So that, that's really one of the things that's associated with it is that the only cue to stop is discomfort. It's, it's eating very large amounts of food when you're not even physically hungry. In fact, you don't even know really how to tell when you're hungry or full. Um, and again, that feeling disgusted and that, that, that shame is, is just so much a part of this. The other thing that's really a part of this is how your world reacts to the results of it. Not all binge eaters are overweight, but the vast majority are. And so they are chided for being overweight. They're thought to just be lazy sloths, and that's the end of that. You know, no willpower. Right. Got that. 
Yeah. So, um, again, for those of you just joining us, I'm Dr. Carol Bernstein, and my guest is Jenny Kramer, MSW. She is founder and executive director of Metro Behavioral Health Associates Eating Disorder Treatment Center in Scarsdale. We are talking about overcoming binge eating disorder, and so for those of you who've been suffering from this, or if you know somebody who has been or has been struggling with anorexia or bulimia, our phone lines are open at one eight seven seven nyu docs That's one eight seven seven six nine eight three six two seven. I'd like to welcome Cynthia from Kansas. You're on Doctor Radio here at Sirius XM eighty one. Thank you for taking my call, Dr. Bernstein. Um, first of all, I just want to say I love all these social workers. I'm getting my um, master's in social work as we speak, and I'll be done in May. So, that, congratulations. Um, That's great. That's thank you. And, and, and on, as an aside, I am a compulsive overeater right now because of my stress level. So it's <laughs> uh, it's ridiculous. I've gained almost 50 pounds. So, oh, my goodness. Anyway, um, I, have a, um, I have a friend of mine who um, has been – um, has, has been to the doctor for binge eating, and, and they actually prescribed uh, Vyvanse, kind of an off-label use, and I'm wondering um, what you know about the research or um, how often or how common is that to, to prescribe somebody a stimulant to overcome some of this binge eating stuff because it just seems like if she's off the medication, then she'll go back to binge eating, and I just don't know how much I like her using it in this way. I don't know. Carol, do you want to go yeah, first? Yeah, sure, I'll go, but I, I figured you were gonna you were gonna turn that up. So first of all, uh, Vyvanse is a very good drug for attention deficit hyperactivity mm -hmm. disorder. I am absolutely not familiar with anybody's using it to treat binge eating. This reminds me of what used to happen 30 or 40 years ago when people were prescribing uh, dextroamphetamine for people who were concerned about weight. Uh, I don't want to make any diagnoses about your friend. Obviously, if someone's prescribing the medication, she's seeing a physician of some type, what I would say is that is not a customary use. You mentioned that it was off-label. Certainly true. Uh, in my own experience, I am not familiar with people prescribing medication like that for binge eating disorder. And I don't know, Jenny, if you've seen this at all. You, were, you worked at Renfrew. You've been in this field a long time. Well, um, I mean, I, I have to say ditto, ditto. I couldn't <laughs> agree more with what you said, Carol. But I'll also say this. There is a very small percentage of cases where some of what we're calling compulsive overeating and binge eating is done as a self-soothing technique for those who actually do have diagnosable ADD. So it's one of the things to sometimes rule out, depending on other behaviors, if that is the case, and I'm talking about a very, very minuscule uh, number of cases, then sometimes that can be helpful because it helps them with the ADD symptoms and they rely less on using food to self-soothe. But in the largest majority of cases, that is really just like prescribing a, a very fancy diet pill. Well, I'll tell you what I can do. I can double check with my friend and expert, Dr. Len Adler here. He runs our adult ADHD clinic. I've talked to him a lot about Vyvanse, but never, mm. never for binge eating. So, Cynthia, you know, I don't know what's going on with your friend, but I would urge him or her to go back to the doctor and have a frank conversation, you know, about that. And thank you for raising it because I think it does, you know, clue into the issues that come up around, you know, how do I, if I'm concerned about overweight, what do I do? And, you know, I think these days not only do we have, you know, the stimulant medications which are around, which certainly cut appetites, but there are people that I believe are using, you know, the new banding techniques in surgery uh, to lose weight, and I think they can also inadvertently lead to eating disorders and, and binging, you know, also because of the feeling of satiety. I mean, you have a band around your stomach, it's difficult to, to tolerate food, and if you're not following the eating instructions correctly post the surgery, I think people do end up uh, purging, which isn't so good. Right. So thank you, Cynthia. Really appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to welcome Kathy from Staten Island. You're on Dr. Radio here at Sirius XM 81. Hi. Good morning. How are you? Fine, thanks. Great show. Thank this you. Terrific. I've been listening uh, religiously every morning. I have a question for someone like myself. Um, your normal routine, you have a normal breakfast, normal lunch, but when it comes to dinner time, you have your main meal, 
and then you just don't stop eating. You could have a party every night until you go to sleep, and you're in a relaxed mode in your bedroom. Is that like a compulsive eating, or is it more of a binge eating? Well, thanks so much for your question, Kathy. Um, this, we hear this so, so commonly that the day seems normal or even restrictive to some, and then something kicks in either at dinner, the preparation of dinner, or right after dinner. I think so. I mean, again, these things sort of overlap, but I think the binge eater knows that they're doing this in their bedrooms, they're doing it in the car, they're doing it on the way to being with people but never with people, um, it's happening in the middle of the night, late at night. And the secrecy uh, is a big component of it. Very big, yeah, very right. big. And, 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 it, and it grows it because the behavior that you're trying to hide, you then do more because it's so painful to have to hide that behavior. So it, it just couples, you know, doubles on itself. Right. Okay, so let's talk. Can you just sort of give us quickly the, the major symptoms of the binge eating? Because certainly the secrecy, the hiding, you know. Yeah, and then there's also just, you know, eating to what we call this point of being uncomfortably full. It, it really only begins to describe it. There's a physical discomfort from eating. I mean, imagine if you're eating, say, a day's worth of calories in one sitting. That's the best way that I can describe what a binge is, and it can be more than that. So there's physical symptoms. Um, there's also what we call dissociative, dissociativeness. Um, at a certain point, your, your brain is sort of flooded with the chemicals and the sugar of eating that much food, and you're almost unaware of what's happening. If you talk to most bingers, how they stop is they either fall asleep or they're in just such physical pain. So that, that's really one of the things that's associated with it is that the only cue to stop is discomfort. It's, it's eating very large amounts of food when you're not even physically hungry. In fact, you don't even know really how to tell when you're hungry or full. Um, and again, that feeling disgusted and that, that, that shame is, is just so much a part of this. The other thing that's really a part of this is how your world reacts to the results of it. Not all binge eaters are overweight, but the vast majority are. And so they are chided for being overweight. They're thought to just be lazy sloths, and that's the end of that. You know, no willpower. Right, got that. Yeah. So, um, again, for those of you just joining us, I'm Dr. Carol Bernstein, and my guest is Jenny Kramer, MSW. She is founder and executive director of Metro Behavioral Health Associates Eating Disorder Treatment Center in Scarsdale. We are talking about overcoming binge eating, disorder and so for those of you who've been suffering from this or if you know somebody who has been or has been struggling with anorexia or bulimia our phone lines are open at 1877 NYU Docs that's 1877 698 3627 I'd like to welcome Cynthia from Kansas you're on Dr. Radio here at Sirius XM 81 Thank you for taking my call, Dr. Bernstein. Um, first of all, I just want to say I love all these social workers. I'm getting my um, master's in social work as we speak, and I'll be done in May. So, that, congratulations. Um, That's great. That's thank you. And, and, and on the, as an aside, I am a compulsive overeater right now because of my stress level. So <laughs> it's uh, it's ridiculous. I've gained almost 50 pounds. So oh my goodness. Anyway, um, I have a um, I have a friend of mine who um, has been um, has has been to the doctor for binge eating. And, and they actually prescribed uh, Vyvanse, kind of an off-label use. And I'm wondering um, what you know about the research or um, how often or how common is that to, to prescribe somebody a stimulant to overcome some of this binge eating stuff? Because it just seems like if she's off the medication, then she'll go back to binge eating. And I just don't know how much I like her using it in this way. I don't know. Carol, do you want to go yeah, first? Yeah, sure, I'll go first. I figured you were gonna you were gonna turn that up. So first of all, uh, Vyvanse is a very good drug for attention deficit hyperactivity mm -hmm. disorder. I am absolutely not familiar with anybody's using it to treat binge eating. This reminds me of what used to happen. 30 or 40 years ago when people were prescribing uh, dextroamphetamine for people who were concerned about weight. Uh, I don't want to make any diagnoses about your friend. 
obviously if someone's prescribing the medication, she's seeing a physician of some type, what I would say is that is not a customary use. You mentioned that it was off-label. Certainly true. Uh, in my own experience, I am not familiar with people prescribing medication like that for binge eating disorder. And I don't know, Jenny, if you've seen this at all. You, were, you worked at Renfrew. You've been in this field a long time. Well, I mean, I, I have to say ditto, ditto. I couldn't agree more with what you said, Carol, but I'll also say this. There is a very small percentage of cases where some of what we're calling compulsive overeating and binge eating is done as a self-soothing technique for those who actually do have diagnosable ADD. So it's one of the things to sometimes rule out, depending on other behaviors, if that is the case, and I'm talking about a very, very minuscule uh, number of cases, then sometimes that can be helpful because it helps them with the ADD symptoms and they rely less on using food to self-soothe. But in the largest majority of cases, that is really just like prescribing a, a very fancy diet pill. Well, I'll tell you what I can do. I can double check with my friend and expert, Dr. Len Adler here. He runs our adult ADHD clinic. I've talked to him a lot about Vyvanse, but never, mm. never for binge eating. So, Cynthia, you know, I don't know what's going on with your friend, but mm. I would urge him or her to go back to the doctor and have a frank conversation, you know, about that. And thank you for raising it because I think it does, you know, clue into the issues that come up around, you know, how do I, if I'm concerned about overweight, what do I do? And, you know, I think these days not only do we have, you know, the stimulant medications which are around, which certainly cut appetites, but there are people that I believe are using, you know, the new banding techniques in surgery uh, to lose weight. And I think they can also inadvertently lead to eating disorders and, and binge, you know, also because of the feeling of satiety. I mean, you have a band around your stomach, it's difficult to, to tolerate food, and if you're not following the eating instructions correctly post the surgery, I think people do end up uh, purging, which isn't so good. Right. So thank you, Cynthia. Really appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to welcome Kathy from Staten Island. You're on Dr. Radio here at Sirius XM 81. Hi. Good morning. How are you? Fine, thanks. Great show. Thank this you. Terrific. I've been listening uh, religiously every morning. I have a question for someone like myself. Um, you normal routine. You have a normal breakfast, normal lunch, but when it comes to dinner time, you have your main meal, and then you just don't stop eating. You could have a party every night until you go to sleep, and you're in a relaxed mode in your bedroom. Is that like a compulsive eating, or is it more of a binge eating? Well, thanks so much for your question, Kathy. Um, this, we hear this so, so commonly that the day seems normal or even restrictive to some, and then something kicks in either at dinner, the preparation of dinner, or right after dinner. You need to maintain a life relationship with food. The good news is, though, that the model of being in a peer group, in a group setting, uh, statistically, has a very, very, very exponentially better um, treatment outcome for people with binge eating disorder. So if 12-step um, works for you, great. If it doesn't, what we recommend is a more short-term, um, you know, eating disorder-related, binge eating disorder-related uh, treatment group, which is very targeted. Um, you know, they're, they're all over the city, and certainly we have them, and, and there are other places that do where that's really the focus. So you're learning skills, you're learning behaviors, but you're also in a room of people who suffer in a similar way to you and know you don't just commiserate. What it is is this moment where you think to yourself, oh, my God, I'm not crazy. There are other people who think and do what I do. So that, that is probably a more helpful model. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sandra, for the question. So, again, uh, for those of you who are struggling with issues related to food, the phone lines are open at one eight seven seven NYU Docs. That's one eight seven seven six nine eight three six two seven. So, Jenny, related to our previous caller, Sandra, let's talk about some of the treatments available. You've already discussed about the the both benefits and limitations of twelve step programs. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you about 
the group settings for a lot of these mm. quote unquote more addictive types of conditions. What other treatments are available? How, I mean, you said, you know, overcoming binge eating for dummies in your book. What are the key take home points here about binge eating? Well, I think the first take home is to be properly evaluated. Right. And that can be done through obviously anyone who's trained as an eating disorder, either psychiatrist, or psychotherapist. Um, I think just to have a comprehensive intake where you really get to look at the, not only the eating patterns, but the family patterns of your life, just, just everything, and just sort of take a moment to see if this is really what you suffer from. Uh, the second part of that is to really have a, a good working relationship with an eating disorder trained dietitian. And I say that specifically because I think dietitians are fabulous. But those who have not worked specifically with eating disorders have a, a slightly different uh, bent, and so they may or may not get the job done as quickly. Um, so working with a nutritionist. Now, if you're a binge eater and you're listening, you might be thinking, well, why would I work with a nutritionist? If I could follow what they would give me, wouldn't that mean that I've been cured? Right. No. I would, okay. Right. No. The, the reason to work with uh, a dietitian is because, first of all, some of the reasons, some of the reasons why people overeat is actually nutritionally driven and they don't even realize it. So it's an opportunity to take a look. Am I eating a large number of, sh of foods that are very sugar laden? Am I eating at particular times of day that don't serve me? Am I eating with much too much time in between each time I eat? Or what is my, what do my portions look like? This isn't a matter of handing you a diet and saying, here, let me know how this works out. It's really about guiding you through something that fits your lifestyle your preferences, your taste. So there's the psychological evaluation, there's the nutrition evaluation. In terms of treatment, the things that we find to be the most useful are, first of all, as we discussed just previously with our caller, a group setting that's right. very targeted for treatment, for skills, for peer review, or all of that so that you really get to be part of a community that's very skills-based. The second thing is obviously targeted psychotherapy. Now, there's a lot of controversy around this. You know, do I just do cognitive behavioral training, you know, CBT? It's a big component, but it's not everything because there's also work to be done on unraveling patterns. If you're a 14-year-old binger, you don't have as many patterns to unravel. If you're a 54-year-old binger, you have a few more patterns to unravel before you can just change of behavior. So Jenny, can you tell us, how would you, what is, what is an example of a CBT technique that you would use with a patient who's binging? Well, similar to what we were discussing with an or earlier caller, sometimes one of the CBT techniques is to really just change place and change routine. Like you were saying, go out and take a walk. To exactly, a or not just as a distraction, but to literally start to create a new neural pathway, like a new, a new uh, routine at 7.30 p.m. instead of the one she was doing. Yeah, I'm, I'm really big, by the way, on relearning. I mean, that's, yeah. it's sort of, it's an overdone term, but I, you know, I think for all of us in the mental health field, looking at behavior and patterns that there's physiology and biology and yeah. psychology, and there are brain pathways, and learning different brain pathways can be very helpful. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. Another technique that we like a lot is just what we call delay. So you have right. an urge right. and you think it's just going to overcome you. It's well, like guess OC what? OCD, we use this in OCD too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if you can literally just delay the urge for 15 mm -hmm. minutes, that's 15 all it really seconds. takes. Right. Yeah, just right. 15 minutes. Now, that doesn't mean stand there and look at your watch for 15 minutes. One of the things we suggest, and people really seem to do very well with this, is to journal, to just right. write like you're a transcriber of everything in your brain. Don't edit, don't, don't, don't comment on it. Just literally write whatever is in your head, whatever your thoughts are, for 15 minutes. Now, a few things happen when you do this. First of all, there's a pretty good chance you're going to lose the urge because your brain's been derailed. Second of all, depending on what you wrote about, 
you may write something that gives you some insight that unravels some feelings that you had that you no longer have to suppress now with food. It also becomes wonderful material to bring into a therapy session if, in fact, you're in treatment for, for anything, but also for, for an eating disorder of any kind. Well, look, we're, you know, we're up against the, our break time here, so we're going to take a little break, Jenny. But for our listeners, I'm delighted to tell you that Jenny Kramer is going to continue with us for our next segment. We're going to continue to talk about overcoming binge eating disorders. Uh, we're going to talk more about these treatment issues. I'm Dr. Carol Bernstein, an associate professor of psychiatry here at NYU. We're going to take a short break, and we'll see you in a few minutes. is Dr. Radio, Sirius XM 81, and on the Sirius XM app for smartphones. The NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament is on Sirius XM. Hi, it's Coach K. Sirius XM is the only place on radio where you can hear every game of the Sweet 16 from Westwood One. On their way to the Sweet 16. Hi, this is Tim Brando, and the Sweet 16 starts Thursday at 7 Eastern. Ball is in the air. For game times and channel listings, go to SiriusXM.com slash college sports. And the game is over. March basketball and Sirius XM. Live to play another day. Wednesday on Doctor Radio at 6 a.m. East. Could a pill packed with the same nutrients as dark chocolate help prevent heart attacks and strokes? Dr. Fred Fine examines the latest research. And no, don't run out and buy that chocolate candy just yet. And AM East, kidney stones. Dr. Rita Curian explains what they are, how to prevent them, and why they are so painful. Plus, learn what role antibiotics and probiotics play in weight loss. That's just some of what's happening Wednesday with repeats throughout the week on Doctor Radio, Sirius XM 81. Sirius XM Channel Spotlight. A home for country rockers, rebels, and misfits. I love country. This is Charity Daniels. This is David Allen Cole. And I was drawn. This is Steve Rowe. Smell of whiskey burning down Copperhead Road. Outlaw Country. Sirius XM 60. Dr. Radio salutes Women's History Month. Hi, I'm Emily Anton. I'd like to recognize Nurse Clara Barton, the angel of the battlefield throughout the American Civil War and the founder of the American Red Cross, as well as the National First Aid Society. Now, aside from her accomplishments in medicine, Barton was also an activist for civil rights and the women's suffrage movement. Thank you, Clara Barton, for the strength and inspiration you give to women today. Dr. Radio salutes you during Women's History Month. Sirius XM brings you every MLB game and a 24-7 channel dedicated to baseball talk. Do you love baseball? From the first pitch of opening night Sunday. to the last out of the World Series, hear the entire 2014 season, including your favorite team's games in your club. Two run, home run for Queen. Your interviews and analysis with our resident experts, including yeah. former All-Stars, managers, and executives. This is shocking news. MLB Network Radio, part of Sirius XM's suite of channels from every major sports league, from the NFL to the NBA. A dose of Dr. Radio. The concepts that are out there where you should avoid, you know, mid-morning and noon sunlight actually will make you more likely to be vitamin D deficient. Labels absolutely have to mention if the major allergens are in there. And not only do they have to mention it, they can't use disguising words. If milk is in the product, it can't just say whey. Dr. Radio, because it matters where and when you get your health information. Sirius XM 81. Unprecedented in access to top physicians and the location within the NYU Langone Medical Center. This is Doctor Radio. Welcome back to all of our listeners to your very favorite Doctor Radio show here at Sirius XM eighty one. I am Dr. Carol Bernstein, an associate professor of psychiatry and vice chair for education in the Department of Psychiatry here at NYU. And yes, Twitterverse out there. Those of you who like Twitter, you can follow us on Twitter at NYU Docs. Find out the topics we're discussing on each show as we're discussing them. 
And again, we are here for our listeners. The whole point of having Dr. Radio is to enable you, the general public, to talk to our experts of, about all of your health concerns. So we'd love to hear from you. Our phone lines are open at one eight seven seven. NYU Docs, that's one 698 You can also email us at docs at SiriusXM.com. And I'm delighted to have on the show with me continuing Jenny Kramer, MSW. She is the founder and executive director of Metro Behavioral Health located in Scarsdale. This is a program that focuses on eating disorders. Um, Jenny has had experience in the treatment of eating disorders for more than a dozen years, has served as the director for a variety of the Renfrew Centers, both in New York and New Jersey. She is author of the new book entitled Overcoming Binge Eating Disorders for Dummies. Very important, and we had just started to talk about treatments, which Jenny, I'm going to come back to in a minute. But first, again, for our listeners, I just want to mention some of the health risks, both of binge eating disorder and disordered eating in general. You can develop type 2 diabetes, gallbladder disease, discs, osteoarthritis, gout, poor wound healing, hiatal hernia, sleep apnea, chronically high blood pressure, heart disease, menstrual problems, uh, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, fatigue, high cholesterol, the list kind of goes on and on, doesn't it, Jenny? Oh, most certainly, and it's really, unfortunately, one of the things that really eventually brings people into treatment at our right. centers is, is the physical aspect of it. Right, so at just before we went to break, we were talking about some of the treatments you were talking about, cognitive behavioral therapy and getting people to write things down. You know, it was very interesting. We had a guest on our first hour named Alan Bernstein who was talking about quitting uh, mm -hmm. a variety of things, not eating disorders per se, but certainly quitting difficult work situations, relationships, or whatever. And it is striking to me how much this issue of writing things down comes up and tries to help people. And how do you see this, and uh, do we have to physically have pen to paper? Can we use our smartphones and iPads and computers to do the same For thing? For all I care, you can write it on the wallpaper. <laughs> I don't care where you write it, because whatever is more comfortable, if your thumbs do the writing faster, be my guest. But the idea is to sort of deflood the brain. I might have just made up a word. I'm not sure. But to deflood the brain so that you're taking all of those thoughts, all of those feelings that we are all so adept at suppressing, holding in, containing, and then just sort of letting them out so that, you know, you see, first of all, yes, I have feelings. Number two, um, it doesn't hurt anybody when I actually express them because they're on paper or they're in my e email or in their, they're in a smartphone, wherever they are. But they're not taking up space in my thoughts and in my feelings right now, which are making me uncomfortable. And because I'm so uncomfortable, I'm, I'm seeking self-soothing self in whatever ways I can. And in what we're talking about particularly is self-soothing through eating, which is not in response to physical hunger. And this is a way that we define this in our centers all the time. When you are eating other than in response to physical hunger, it's worth taking a look. Well, and, and have, yeah. how do you help people pay attention to physical hunger? Well, there, there's a very key issue because for years and years they haven't, and they didn't right. even know that they weren't. Right. So first of all, you know, we will we'll actually have a meal with them right in the office setting. Um, it's a very comfortable situation, you know, and it's all very pre-planned, but we'll do a guided meal with them so that we can take them through, first of all, the pace. I mean, if... If your callers take nothing away from this show today but this tip, this is an important one. Your brain and, and digestive system cannot communicate with each other properly unless you eat at a normal pace. If you eat quickly, the hormones that are responsible for appetite suppression and satiety will not kick in. And so if you do nothing else, Eat whatever you've been eating, eat whenever you have been eating, but please put the fork down in between each bite. And nobody has to know you're doing that. It's not so obvious. But by doing that, you create a natural 
metronome, which creates a pace, and you actually give your body a chance to tell you that it's full instead of tell you that it's exploding and busting, which is a very big difference. Right. I, I mean, that, you know, it's like take a break, sit, and it, it's kind of what you were saying before, like sit and wait 15 minutes. Yes. You know. Ur ur urges will go away, not forever, obviously, but right. they will go away if you can literally just hold off for 15, 20 minutes. And again, not standing there watching you watch for that period of time, but doing something else that has, that has meaning. Yeah, right, finding an alternative. Well, can you, can you also talk about some of the special groups that binge eat? So men, children, men, women in menopause, people who are obese. Well, I, I have to say, Carol, that I think really what we're finding now is that it's all over the place, but right. truly, statistically at this moment, uh, it is many more women than men, although I have to say that number is growing faster than we can catch up with it. I think the growing no, the number yeah. of men. Oh, yeah. gosh, yes. I think we're going to see in the next round of uh, literature that it's, it's much, much higher than we thought. Um, also, you know, if you think about who's most vulnerable, it's usually life stage changes. So, right. first of all, people who are entering college. That is a very, very lovely, wonderful, and absolutely tumultuous time. So there's lots of eating changes that take place even in the binge eating disorder realm. That's one period of life. Another period of life is really um, perimenopause, which frankly can start as early as 35, but perimenopause and into menopause, where suddenly, both physically and emotionally, there are changes occurring that seem completely involuntary. And so um, there's, there's emotional changes at that stage of life because, you know, there's perhaps less people to take care of. There's a life review. Am I happy in my life? Did I make good decisions? Am I happy in my career, my family, all of that? And because your body is physically changing. For men, it seems to occur the most... Uh, although it can happen at any time, it seems to occur the most in what I'll call early middle age. So let's say late 30s, early 40s is where it starts to kick in. Maybe they've been athletic their whole lives and they could eat anything they want, and right. suddenly their metabolism is catching up with them. It can be that simple. Right. Yeah. Certainly get it. Change points in our lives are always put us at risk for different types of behaviors. And again, we're talking about overcoming Binge Eating Disorders with my guest, Jenny Kramer, who is the Executive Director of Metro Behavioral Health in Scarsdale and the author of a new book entitled Overcoming Binge Eating Disorder for Dummies. And for you listeners out there, do you have an eating disorder of any type? Or is there someone you love who is suffering from an eating disorder? We'd, we'd really enjoy hearing from you. Our phone lines are open at one 877 NYU Docs, that's one 877 You can also email us at docs at SiriusXM.com. So, Jenny, what about bulimia and anorexia in terms of distinguishing it from binge eating, and what do you see in your uh, center? Well, what we see uh, mostly is that with anorexia and bulimia, and for anybody who might not know, you know, anorexia is obviously um, very, very, very um, preoccupied with body image and wanting to be an extremely, extremely low weight that's very, very unhealthy, either by restricting uh, or by actually purging every small amount of food they eat. Bulimia is binging activity, but always followed by some kind of purge, which could be self-induced vomiting. It could be with laxatives or other such things. What we find is that all of these eating disorders that we're talking about, including binge eating, are all on a continuum. They're all very similar to one another. They just get expressed differently. And the largest majority of people have a tendency to be non-discriminating and to participate in all three. Because if you think about it, when someone has an anorexic tendency, at a certain point, they're, it's so restrictive, it's so depriving that they may swing to the other side because they've just felt so deprived. And so you can imagine that that would lead to 
not just regulated eating, but then maybe overeating. And so then, if they find that they're overeating and, oh, my God, all my systems don't work the way they used to, I used to have a whole plan in place, now they, they discover purging. So it, it, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle unless you intervene at the right points in the cycle. Right. You know, really very uh, challenging, I think, uh, for, for a lot of people to understand that these disorders really uh, track together. I'd like to welcome Liz from Maryland. You're on Dr. Radio here at Sirius XM 81. Great. Thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. I'm a physician assistant. I practice, I'm a PA, and I practice in Annapolis, Maryland. I work for a doctor who does um, kind of one of her niches is uh, eating disorders, and so I'm learning quite a bit about this. I just started working with her. My mother had it when I was growing up. She had bulimia for years, and I was wondering, is there a genetic predisposition to question. these disorders? Fabulous question. Thank you so much, um, Liz, and I also have to just say, I love PAs. I love PAs and nurse oh. practitioners. They're just great parts of our profession. Um, I, you know, I, I, there is a what we like to call an inheritability. But let me be very clear. You can't give this to somebody. You know, I hear this all the time from the parents who bring their, their loved ones in to be treated. Nobody's responsible for this. It's not that anybody, you know, caught it. It's not contagious. However, the statistics show us that if you have addictions in your bloodlines, in your family of origin, in your grandparents, and, and if, 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 if that's there, you have a higher chance of developing some sort of addictive disorder and or eating disorder, but it's not your fate. Uh, it's just a much higher chance. Now, part of that is nature, part of that is nurture. Part of it is that if you've lived with someone who has really exhibited these behaviors, can you learn them? Yeah, you can, uh, but they're driven by something much different than the person who originally has them. So again, it's a matter of seeking treatment early, and it's also if you are someone who suffers and you have children, you want to make sure that you get treatment for you so that you have less chance of exhibiting those kinds of behaviors. And I don't even just mean eating disorder behaviors. I mean all of the discomfort and the anxiety and the depression that usually come with them. I don't know if that answers your question, Liz. It, it does. I, and my second question is for, for the female uh, population that have these disorders. Is it, have they linked it to, it seems to be the relationship with their father is, is one of the nature parts of predisposition then to have the disorder. Is that more common too? Well, uh, um, yes and no. There's a wonderful okay. book which is called Father Hunger, and yeah. it's written by Dr. Margot Main. And it's a wonderful book because it really talks about the perception of uh, a female relationship with her father. And so that has a lot to do with who we are as females, it has to, whether we've had a father or not, by the way, but it also has to do with part of our identity. It is not so that you are more likely to have an eating disorder if you have not had a father. It is not so that um, you are more likely to have an eating disorder if your father was afflicted rather than your mother. However, what we do see, and this could be by a father or mother or anyone else, is that in more than three quarters of cases of all forms of eating disorders, there has been some identified abuse, be it physical, emotional, or sexual, um, in one's past. And that doesn't obviously necessarily be by a parent, but it can be by anyone. That's, that's one of the critical factors. That's really Great. Thank you so much. Liz, thank, thank you. you for your questions. They were very, very thoughtful. And I want to go back a minute, Jenny, to, you know, one of the things that happens, and it's even happened here in the medical center when, uh, you know, if you get concerned about a house officer who might have anorexia, how do you stage an intervention? What do you advise the people who love the person that they see? And I see this particular, I mean, bulimia may occur in secret, the binge eating may occur in secret. Anorexia, when you see someone who's anorexic, it's pretty obvious to everybody who's going around, 
What should someone who loves someone do in the, what can they do? I'm going to start by answering what they shouldn't do, if you don't mind. <laughs> That's so, great. That's okay, so what helpful. they shouldn't do is, for, particularly for an anorexic, is to say, did you eat? How much did you eat? Right. Here, have some more. Don't you, aren't you hungry? Wouldn't you like this? Are you sure you had enough? That's the last thing they need to hear because if it were that simple, they wouldn't be afflicted. If they just needed to be told to eat, that would be the end of that. The second thing is it's very difficult to watch someone you love and watch their weight keep dropping and dropping to below what would be normal for their height. And so if you're not sure if that's the case, you know, if you have a loved one, you can say to them, you know, honey, I, I'm, I'm concerned about you. I love you. I love you no matter what, but I love you. Would you, would you please let, let us just go get checked at our doctor, just your local doctor first. Start right, there. Right, right, right. Now, I have to say there was a wonderful article um, this week in, of all places, Glamour magazine um, <laughs> about physicians who are, uh, to this point, largely ill-trained about how to interact with eating disorders, but nonetheless, uh, so it's an area of training that needs to be worked on, but nonetheless, it's a good starting point because it gives you some concrete information to work from. Has there been a change in lab work? Is the height to weight ratio really as dangerous as, as you think it is? Because appearances can be deceiving. In the, in the final analysis, if someone is an adult age and they are not willing to right. even check it out, right. you, your, your options are limited. Yep. I mean, obviously, you care about them. If they're living with you, you have a few more rights. You know, you get to say, look, I can't stand by and watch the bus hit you, so please, please allow me to just get you evaluated. But it's a very tough thing. I think, you know, I think you're right, and I, you know, this actually comes up in a lot of areas of psychiatry, not just the ones related to eating disorder, and I feel so terrible saying to people, look, you know, sometimes you, it just had to, has to get to a point where it's really, really bad. You know, somebody can't yeah. get around, uh, somebody's so psychotic they're found walking in the streets, you know, yeah. and uh, I hate to say that, but it's, it is very, very distressing for someone to watch someone deteriorate like that. Well, I can tell you that for our office, you know, in the city, 90% uh, of the people that come, on, come in with anorexia who come in on their own, the thing that had them come in was that they passed out in the subway. That's all it yeah. takes, you know. Wow. You pass out in the subway, you, you, you realize you have an issue, and it scares, it scares the heck out of them. Yeah. Uh, what about... Uh, parents of teenage daughters, just because that, I assume you see a lot of that in both your sides. Oh, God. So, oh, gosh, yes. So I, I'm, I'm curious as to what the, you know, in some of it, and I will say, I don't know about the anorexia so much because we all know that's much more refractory, but yeah. certainly with the bulimia and perhaps even with the binging, mm -hmm. you know, kids go off to college, some of this starts, and they get over it. But what can parents do? So important. Well, again, it's the same list of what not to do, but right, also um, to really take a look. It also depends on the age. So, okay. so let's say we're dealing with kids that are, say, in high school, because this is a lot of what we see also, you right. know, middle school, high school, and you're a good parent and you keep watching the trend. Either the weight is going very down or it's going way up. Again, especially if the weight is going up, not to comment on size because I would encourage all loving parents to just take a look for a moment at your own view of your own body, because that's generally where the comment is coming from. You know, it doesn't mean you're not genuinely concerned. It doesn't mean you don't really love them. Of course you do. But take a look. Is it concern because you think my child is now going to be made fun of because they're getting big? Or is it more I am secretly a bit ashamed of what my kid looks like. And so either way, until you're sure, you don't want to comment on the size. And you certainly don't want to say to your child, oh, honey, let's go to Weight Watchers together. Because right. Right. The, the, the child themselves may not have actually realized they had an issue yet. And so now all they know is that they've displeased you in some way. So I think, again, it's really about finding the sweet spot, finding where is the point of motivation for that child? If your kid comes to you and says, I don't understand, my friends are dating, I'm not, okay, 
there's a conversation to be had. What's that like? How do you feel about yourself? If they have health issues, you know, what, the, the thing that brings people into our office at that age group the most yeah. is when a 16-year-old hasn't gotten a period right. yet. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're the high sign. Something, something's not right. Uh, but it, it really is a very case-by-case -case basis. But again, in the best effort to not be critical and to not be hypercritical and to not be an alarmist either, use your pediatrician, use your, your family doctor as the first point of intervention. If you're in a metropolitan area like we here are in New York and you have the ability to seek out a consultation with people who are specifically eating disorder trained, all the better. But really, you know, be gentle about it unless there's been some, you know, medical mishap. Right. I mean, I think, I think you're absolutely right about this size issue. Um, but again, I think it's particularly challenging for, kid, for parents when, and again, I think the anorexia piece is the scariest piece. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the overweight, I mean, kids, you know, they certainly go through a lot of that in, in adolescence. We only have about a minute left. Any final tips for everybody? Well, I really think the biggest tip I can give is to, first of all, be kind to yourself. You know, part of why all of these behaviors begin to begin with is really because you're busy beating up on yourself or you're emulating someone else who kind of beat up on you a little bit. Just be kind and gentle and remember that we have this gift which is called a new day every day. When you wake up in the morning, you have a new fresh day in front of you every day if Great. you're lucky. I'm sorry we're out of time. I want to thank my guest, Jenny Kramer, MSW, founder and executive director of Metro Behavioral Health and author of Overcoming Binge Eating for Dummies. I'd also like to thank my producer, Melanie Crone, my soundboard engineer, Amore Butte, and my program director, Maurice Tunick. I'm Dr. Carol Bernstein. I'll see you next week on the radio.